Just listen and trust your gut. Business of Architecture, episode 427. Hello, Architect Nation. Enix Sears here. As we've researched and worked with firm after firm, hundreds of firms, both in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, South Africa, South America, Mexico, Japan, and beyond, what we've discovered is that there's a common thread that stands out from those firms who have more success than other firms. And the caliber and experience of the people working at the firm is this thread. That's why the People Playbook is one of the four pillars of the Smart Practice Method. So on today's episode, you'll hear from Lance Psycho, currently running a a firm called F9 Productions with his co-founder, Alex Gore. They're based out of Colorado. Lance and Al have built their practice from just themselves to over 10 employees in the past seven years. So I asked Lance, what has been the hardest part about growing a practice from zero employees to 10 employees. In today's episode, you'll discover Lance's answer and his very, very sage advice. Lance, welcome to the business of architecture. Enoch, thanks for having me. It's always an honor to be here. Absolutely. Now, for those of our guests or listeners who haven't heard of you before, first of all, we have to let them know about the Inside the Firm podcast. Give us the 30-second the update on what's happening over there with the other podcast venture, why they should go listen just in case they're not. Yeah, everybody should check out Inside the Firm podcast because we tell everything. Uh, Mark LePage, our good friend over at the uh, Entree Architect podcast, he likes to say that it is our executive meeting that we're letting in, everybody inside of. And uh, for a big part of it, I, I agree with that statement. Um, we started the podcast about five years ago, and we kind of backtracked a little bit and told the story of our origin story from a very firsthand perspective. Then we ended up doing a development, then starting a construction company, and we lay everything bare for everybody. So if you're looking for an inside look, Inside the Firm podcast. I love it. And this is really, really great because I I can't think of many other firms that have actually documented their growth because you started that podcast pretty close, if not when you started the firm. Is that right? How far apart were those two? It was still in the startup phase. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So it's been around for five years. We started it in 2017. Um, We had only been an we had only been going um, for so maybe at the tail end of our startup, but we were just kind of we were still rookies, I'd say, with that at that point. I mean, I think now we are a tenured firm, literally over 10 years. Um, we have an established name in and around town and the region and everything. But that's what, kind of what I mean by backtracking is so even though we did start it later, we still went backwards and even looked up old emails about how we got our first clients and told those stories in the first hundred episodes about how it all worked, hiring our first employees, firing our first employees, how to maintain kind of our current staff, and that whole growth all along the way. And then even, you know, through episodes 100 to 200, um, then there was there was points where it was like, oh, we got to come up with content. And we would remember things that we hadn't talked about yet, and then kind of brought those into the fold. So overall, we have, no matter what, you know, went back and, and then kind of retold those stories and framed them in the current time. That's so remarkable, Lance. It's the I think it's the only example that I know of of an architecture firm that has literally documented the process of growth over the years. So that's pretty remarkable. And what a gift to the industry and to the upcoming designers and architects out there. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, we have a great uh, listenership from very young folks, too. So, you know, we track things with our social media team, just like everybody else does. I'm sure you do, too, is um, and we, we do that in a metric in LinkedIn. And we're finding that a large part of our audience is the college age students or people just entry level. We, we can tell who's kind of following us and clicking on our links and everything like that. So that's the kind of uh, well, well, that's kind of sort of the impact we're trying to make is from a lower level. Um, because the older folks are just they're there and they're already established and everything. And, and we want to give a different look um, at what it's like to run a business um, from our perspective, because we were in their shoes when we started. And I think there there can't be enough of that. We actually haven't talked about this particular thing here at Business of Architecture. But right now, I'm in the market to acquire a practice, to acquire a firm explicitly for the opportunity to be able to do exactly what you guys have done, which is broadcast the inner workings of it and literally talk about how it's going on a day-to-day basis. So 
within the next six or seven or eight months, we'll throw that into the mix. So there's a little preview for our listeners as well. Hey, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I wonder where you got the idea. I know, I know. <laughs> just I just teasing. <laughs> thought, thought these really good looking guys in Colorado, I thought, geez, man, that is a brilliant idea. Gotta but I think it. that there's there's not enough content that can be created around that, right? There's different yeah. perspectives. And so for those of our listeners out there who you may, even as you're listening to this, have thought in the past, what if I started a podcast or, you know, who are these guys, Enoch and Lance, to be on a podcast? Why aren't I on a podcast? I think Lance and I would both agree, go for it, do it. If you feel something's calling you, you have a message you want to get out there, podcast is an easy way to do it. We need more people sharing what's happening inside their firm. So go for it. We're all... We're, we're your biggest fans, and I'm sure, at least from our side, we would love to support anyone who feels like they want to do the same, document what's happening in yeah, the firm. Yeah, I, I am a firm believer, just like you are, about that. It, I don't believe in scarcity. I live. I believe in a, a life of abundance, right? Yeah. Uh, Genesis, Genesis 128 is one of my favorite like Bible quotes, and so I kind of think about that all throughout life, right? Um, you know, Genesis there's, 128. There's, tell- yep. There, there's more. There's more. There's always more. Be fruitful and multiply, right? Ah, oh, Yes. So, uh, so uh, on that podcast, now, I don't know if you think like this, so I'm just kind of asking you and sorry to turn it around like me being the guest now is asking you a question, but do you, do, somebody said this to me about like a year ago and they said, isn't it cool that you like, you look up your downloads, another podcaster, totally different industry. And they're like, you have a, let's say you have a thousand listens that day or downloads. Now imagine you're in an auditorium. It's the same thing. It's the mm. same thing. A thousand people are listening to you. So yeah. even if you're an introvert, but you feel comfortable getting in front of a microphone on your own, in your own room, wherever you're at, and telling your story, talking about whatever it is you do, and let's say you have a hundred downloads that day, you know, the first day you do it or the third day or whatever. Imagine now that's an auditorium, but without the stage fright. That's yeah. huge. That's impact. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's really interesting. As as you said that, this was this is interesting. As you said that, actually what happened in my mind, I never quite thought about it like that myself, Lance. And it was interesting because I've been doing this for a long time, over ten years to the Business of Architecture podcast, but there was a bit of there was a bit of insecurity that came up for me. Isn't that interesting? So yeah. there's a bit of the imposter syndrome. and there's a bit of me thinking, oh my goodness, I gotta up level our content. You know, if I look at our number of downloads, we get a lot of downloads every single month. And I'm like, man, that you're right. Those are that could fill a stadium of people. And yeah. are we doing a good enough job of delivering top content? So if you're listening to this today, if you feel inadequate, if you feel as people call it, I hate it's kind of a buzzword of an imposter syndrome or feel like you're mm-hmm. not good enough, it never goes away. So just might as well push on through it if you're going to do something big and really live out your life's purpose. 100%, yeah. Okay. Lance, what I'd like to ask you is the three things that, because you've taken a practice, you and Al have taken a practice from zero to, to 10 people right now. You have two people on the construction side. You have eight people on the design side. What I'd like to know is what have been the three top challenges or obstacles, the three hardest things about taking a practice from just a couple of people, which frankly isn't that hard. Anyone could go out and hire some freelancers or bring on a couple of people. Now it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but yeah. <laughs> it's a whole different thing than actually then maintaining that and building to a team of to eight, eight designers, eight design staff. So what would you say, what have been the three hardest things about growing from zero to, to 10 right, where you're at now? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, 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 my answers, just so the audience knows, are, are more skewed to the architecture side. We can kind of touch base, I think, after I answer these three, maybe on the construction side, because that's a different hiring, 100%. I mean, white collar versus blue collar, that's just, it's just such a vastly different world. So the, the first thing is uh, just hiring, just the word hiring. And uh, people are afraid, when, when you're a sole proprietor, I think it's, you're, you probably have twice as big of a problem as me and Alex had at the beginning because there was two of us at least at the beginning. So we kind of already had the multiplication factor. So, you know, obviously if you can find a bit, somebody you can trust through and through, I mean, like a best friend, like a wife basically, or a husband or like that kind of partner, like that's what a business partner really ends up being is that kind of like lifelong level trusting person. But to the hiring side, why the biggest hurdle we found was, it's like, when do, when can you hire somebody? What are the metrics that set you up to reduce that anxiety that you have before you jump over the fence to hire somebody and then commit to that person? Because 
you know, the responsibility that I think you take on by hiring somebody is, well, you are helping them win the bread. Like you're the person, you know, getting the wheat, then they're making the bread themselves. That's sort of the analogy I like to make with the whole thing. So the rule of thumb that we kind of came up with, and it, it's all organic, and that's how we grew the firm was organically. And that back to the, you know, our podcast and what we do, we, we kind of tell that story and maybe it's for better or for worse, but um, we, the rule of thumb is we, three projects. If you have three projects and you're a sole proprietor that you can't touch. So let's say you already had three on your plate, three houses, and you get a call from Frank, the developer on um, the next Monday. And he says, I want to hire you guys for, I want to hire you for three more houses. All of a sudden it's like, you could either tell Frank, I can't touch those until, you know, for two more quarters, or it, maybe it's time to hire somebody. And the reason why I think three is the magic number for that is, um, let's say they start on project A. They start on project A, they finish a set of floor plans, then they email you a PDF for you to redline as the project architect and, and take a look at. Um, well, they need something to do while you're redlining. There's project B. And then they can start on project B, and then, and then maybe they're even done with project B by the time you're not done redlining A, and then they at least have C. Well, guaranteed you're going to have, you know, you should have A kind of red line by then. There's that kind of dynamic of we just believe in you need to, you, we both, Alex and I both ha were in firms. I won't say names, but like when we were in our very young in our career before we started our firm. And there was a lot of we really don't have anything to do. We need to look busy. Like, it's not our fault we don't have anything to do. And so there's a lot of panning in and out of cat or rabbit and just like moving the mouse around, trying to look busy. And it's because I think they hired us without having at least three projects to put on our plate right away. You know, that, and then delegated them out sequentially. So that's the one big reason is just like the workflow that you need to have going for that. Um, coupled with that, I always recommend that people if you aren't, when you're signing new contracts with clients, um, especially when you're, if you're thinking about hiring a new employee, if you aren't taking an upfront retainer that gets applied to the overall fee and increasing that cash flow at the beginning, you are going to increase your anxiety and then your risk of failure because you don't have that cash flow to make up for there. Maybe that maybe they don't really actually get to billable point for like the first month type of thing, right? Before you get to that first deliverable. So that's a, a sort of a critical nuance to the whole thing. And then the other big part to that, I think, is the three projects idea is uh, what if one falls through, right? I mean, then you at least have, you know, it's like a stool. Um, you could potentially sit on a stool with two legs, but certainly not one. Um, it's just more stability. So more, more, more uh, irons you can put in the fire, so to speak, right at the beginning. I think that's one of the keys to hiring. It's just the logistics and the anxiety. Uh, when it comes to who you should hire, um, I was just talking about this with somebody else. I think there, there's just some, I like to talk about yellow flags and red flags about like w just things to avoid that you can see right away. And I would say if, let's say somebody interviews, you interview somebody, here's a re red flag that we had to, we had to learn the hard lesson on a couple people with this. Um, we interviewed them. We loved them. Uh, we thought they loved us. We offered them a job. They declined it. Uh, then we put the job uh, back up on LinkedIn or whatever platform we were advertising it on. Two months later, that same person came back and they said, hey, I, I saw you guys have that position open. And then, you know, they asked, and we told them, oh, yeah, it's still open, but uh, I thought you took another job. And then the red flag with there is like, you weren't their first choice. So if you aren't their first choice, you no matter you're always going to be the second choice, no matter what. I don't care how well you treat that person because we have brought those people in as our as being their second choice, and we have treated them very very well. Like raises within like a month or something, just to kind of hey look, we like we're you're doing great, you know all of these things, being flexible, stuff like that. Um, and it was still not enough. As soon as as soon as they found that first choice again, and it was available, um, they they were ready to go. Right. So you got to they, they the the people you have to be their first choice um, for the whole thing. I don't think I'm also of the opinion you don't hire the same person twice. So um, there is something psychologically uh, to us where 
we're just humans and we have this nostalgia. We always think that the past is better, and maybe sometimes it is. But uh, is it really? It's hard to say. And so if they leave your firm, let's say they even just go to grad school. We had some folks do that. Um, they finished their undergrad. They insisted on getting a graduate degree, and no matter what we said, and then they came back, and it was kind of a disaster because they remembered that old – not that the firm had evolved, but just – Maybe there's different dynamics in the firm. Maybe they get thrown into a different, uh, you know, and maybe somebody is kind of taken their place. There's just all of these psychological things that go on with that. So I, I would watch out for those things. Um, and then I think when you go to hire somebody, let's say the third one, and that's kind of my, I think I'll end it there with hiring because I'm saying a lot here. And there's two other topics we want to talk about, but that is when you're hiring somebody from out of state, this is kind of our own, again, sort of anecdotal Colorado is a destination place. Um, people come here from all over out of the, out of state, um, often from the Midwest, like on the plains, because they want to live in the mountains, near the mountains. They want that outdoor life, hiking, skiing, fishing, hunting, all of that good stuff. And uh, so when they move, I, I'm one of them who did that. There's oftentimes they don't have any family here at all. And so what we noticed is um, the folks that have moved here that we have essentially moved here from somewhere else who have stuck with us and haven't had a large set of anxiety happen in their personal life, they have some tie, right? So ask if you can find in that candidate, do you have an uncle? Do you have anything? Uh, do you have a church you go to? You know, do you have some kind of thing that you're going to latch on to community wise because they need something like that because you're going to feel, um, sort of floating around uh, right away when you move to a place like that. So it's very important. It doesn't matter how much money you offer somebody or even like moving, like you pay their moving expenses and all kinds of stuff. It's just not, that's not going to compensate for sort of this floating feeling that you have. So for out of state folks, when you're hiring people from out of state, you know, e even if it's uh, like for me, if, if somebody would have said when I moved here and if I was single, I wasn't. And if they would have said, do you have anything like, why are you moving to Colorado? And I'd go, oh, well, my passion is fishing. And they would say, oh, well, okay. And then I'd be like, yeah, like, trust me. If I'm not working, I'm going to be fishing. Like, it's, oh, I'm not going to get sad about it because there's so, it's Colorado. There's so many creeks and lakes and all that stuff in the mountains. So some kind of tie like that. That's beautiful. Take me back to what was the most challenging hire that you had to make or the one that made your back tingle the most, the one that brought up the hairs on your arm and made you think, Ooh, this one's going to be a difficult. Was do you have anything like that, or were they oh, all gosh, just pretty yeah. much easy? <laughs> we got so lucky on the first couple, but there and they were real easy. And then they were just we're still fighting to get this. That's one I would probably hire back. Anyway, the one that made me uh, for sure that I can think about that made my hair stand up a little bit, or just it just gave me a general anxiety, and I I knew with my gut that it was a bad idea. Mm. Uh, we were going to. We were ready to build the second uh, set pair of tiny houses, and uh, it was for a Fortune 500 company, so very big deal for us. One of our biggest design build projects to date, it was back in uh, 2015. And um, we did, we were hiring architecture at that point because the tiny houses were coming online, and it was like, we were still young where we didn't, young, young firm where we didn't have the construction arm established, so we had to hire people to fill the architecture roles while we took the architecture firm and turned them into a construction firm for a few months. So we did a whole round of interviews and people and this one gent came into the office and he was, uh, on paper, he looked amazing. He was kind of exactly what we what we're looking for. Cause we like folks who have hands-on experience in construction. Um, and so a head on their shoulders, cause we know they're also grounded too, just as people because they feel the physical world more than digital folks. And so he, you know, but the interview, he was a nervous wreck. Like I couldn't believe, and I feel like I'm not that intimidating. Maybe I am. Maybe Al, maybe it's Al. And <laughs> You're scaring me, right? I mean, I, I'm nervous over here, Lance. What are you doing? You're so intimidating. <laughs> so, so he was so nervous and everything. And, uh, I just, it just went so poorly that I thought, man, it, I don't know what that's about hmm. because I was even trying to give compliments well, we didn't hire him for the architect position, but um, then some just some other staff things happened. It was all good stuff, but it got and then we got more work, and it it was like, well, 
I told Al uh, about a week after that, right before we were going to start this tiny house, these two tiny houses, I thought, I need somebody on site all the time. And I can't do that because I'm just like you, Al. We're teaching at CU. We're running the firm. We're doing all – got families. So I said, what, if, what about this guy? Like, I know he was terrible in the interview for architecture and – you know, we don't really need an architect right now. We filled that role because we, we didn't. Have, that's what it was. We ended up filling the role. And uh, he goes, yeah, call him up. Called him up. And he did a great job. If it wasn't for him on uh, if it wasn't for him on that project, um, there would have been more sleepless nights. It just would have it just wouldn't have been as as tight as it could have been. And we finished on time and we did a good job and it was profitable and everybody was happy and all of that. Uh, but then after that, and here's where it, the, the hiring kind of, so he, he, the construction work was done and I mean, there was no more. It was like time to go back to the architecture office and he kind of pushed his way into the office. I mean, really, really pushed. It just, it was, I've never had anybody do that where it's kind of, it's like the story you hear about like, oh, I knocked in that architect's office every single day for 40 years. And then he finally hired me. It was like one of those. And, um, I got so tired of here. Like I was like, okay, okay, how, I'll, I will hire you, but here's a very specific sect of work that you get to do. And it was basically BIM modeling, so it was all uh, the families for like that are up on Arcat and everything like that. And um, eventually, that work ran dry. I, we just did, and it was like, oh, okay. Well, he did okay on that stuff. We did make ten percent on all of his projects combined. It seems like it's okay. His attitude's good. He's got a good work ethic. Um, maybe he can become an architect. Maybe maybe this strange anxiety and overthinking, he's done with it. I, I don't know. I'm willing to give everybody a shot, I guess. And uh, it didn't work out. It was just, it just, the nosedive went absolutely. So my original gut thoughts and, and feelings were 100% correct. It was, so I think you got to trust your gut. If you have that kind of, um, just bad feeling from the get go, even though they look really good on paper. Uh, and even though they're persistent and even though you think they're going to have a good work ethic and maybe even go through some kind of process like we did where you went from architecture interview to hired on construction back to architecture. It's probably an anomaly, but maybe, um, that's the story. I, I just don't, uh, it ended up pretty bad in the end. It was, it was the first person we had to fire. Uh, so it was a good lesson for us about firing folks and, Kind of segueing into that, I think that was one of your. Hey, what are the three things with? Um, with yeah, what, yeah. What was growing two? Oh, well, two, two would be firing exactly. Yeah. So that's the hardest part about growing a firm is like, when do you fire people? And uh, so when we did fire that gentleman, it was swift and fast. And I learned my lesson from the first time, and so did Al about trusting my gut. I could just feel it. It was like, we got to fire this person. Like this is. And then that's kind of when we established the three three strike rule at the firm. Basically, if you screw up huge, right, to the point where you're costing the firm money in extra engineering fees or or uh, we're almost lawyer to lawyer or, you know, some giant thing like that, a big miss, um, you get a strike, three strikes you're out while well, he was on his third strike. Um, I don't know. No, he was going to get to his second strike and we were like, this is it. Like, we're not even going to go to the third strike you know day one one day to the next it was just a quick firing you were done and all of that we even talked on the show i think it was i think the episode is called uh hire slow and fire fast um so 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 there's that side of firing folks but then lately what has been happening and and alex and i are big proponents of uh chicago school of uh economics austrian school of economics so I, you know, th this boom and bust cycle that happens um, is real. Uh, and so knowing that that I'm always of the how can we stay ahead of the next recession, the next boom? And, you know, all the headlines are coming out now. Like, it's very obvious you can't print this much money and not have things go fall down. And then all the inflation happened. And now the interest rates are rising. And we know what happened last time when the interest rates went up. They popped the housing bubble. So me and Al are looking at this right now in the last, since January, going, like, how do we prepare for this recession? Well, we can pay down all of our debts. We can increase fees as much as possible. We can try to save as much money as possible. We can be as lean and mean and as efficient as possible. But what about staff? Like, is there anybody that should get cut or anything like that? And what we have, what we have experienced lately is 
Um, two on the architecture side have left. And so we were 10, for, we were up, up to 10, now we're down to eight. And then one person from the construction side, uh, he's leaving on August 1st, from three to two. And so what we noticed is on, on the architecture side is um, the two that left, um, they were questionable. It was a, it was, it was, there was, the work was questionable. Uh, the fitting into our culture, which is extremely important to what we do, because what Alex and I want to do, want to, we've always wanted to establish in which, what, what does happen is proof of, proof of, proof of positive culture and people wanting to come to work because it's a fun environment to be with is, for example, on a Friday, our satellite office comes up to Longmont. And then we're all together again. We go out to eat uh, for lunch. We play ARE Jeopardy on the podcast. It's fun. It's jovial. Everybody's having a great time. Everybody's still productive. We want to be able to walk in on those Friday mornings and it to just be buzzing upstairs, buzzing with productivity, buzzing with pro- with positivity, just buzzing in the perfect kind of sense of the word. And um, those one of the pers- one of the people that left was just a buzz killer. I mean would just take the whole thing would just from 10 to one the other the other person maybe she would take it from seven to one but or or, you know or like sorry 10 to like three but still it was just not what we were doing no matter what we tried no matter how much you know we we would even have some private meetings like hey we don't bite it's fun like how, how can we help you all of these things and uh they ended up leaving and then as soon as they left then, you know, I, I watch the numbers every every day, every week, uh, every month, every quarter, every year. All of a sudden, it was like, whoa, last month we were at 20% profitability. Whoa, it's the second month after we left, we're at 30% profitability, 40. It just kept going up. We've kind of hit a plateau now um, this last couple of months because summer, summer. But it was like, oh, we didn't have to fire them in a way. Like, they just let themselves go. It was a perfectly mutual um, part parting for the whole thing. And so there are like graceful ways that it happens. And I think, again, it, what it really comes down to is with that scenario is like, what culture are you establishing in your firm? And people will find out if they fit in or not They're It's either they're going to be comfortable or they're not. And ours, almost everybody's an extrovert, um, in the firm. And those two were not at all. That's the tricky part of back to hiring again. Sorry to go back to that, but that's like, how do you test if they're extroverts, if you have an extrovert firm? Because everybody can put on a facade in that first um, uh, interview. So what we decided we would do is, besides doing the whole, and one of them was also out of state too, so that's kind of where that play comes in with what we talked about earlier. But how do you uh, get that extra, how do you test and see if they are introvert or extrovert out of it? And I think we're gonna do two things from now on, is we're gonna try to do a personality test and just see where that's at and then have a second interview where they actually come um, and try to do like an activity, but not with us. They have to interact with everybody else. Like we can't be a part of that because, you know, you're still a superior if you're me and Al because we own the firm. Um, so you got to try to recreate that sort of that nostalgia. Maybe maybe they come in on a Friday. So it's even more fun because the bosses are gone and they uh they 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 do work for a day they get paid for it and everything like that but it's just sort of a test run i think that is maybe where you got to go and that's probably as much as you can do um as testing those waters and everything no why are the bosses gone on friday i must have missed that oh i just i'm just i'm just saying if we were to create an environment for that second interview where we aren't there okay that I just made that up on the fly. Okay, got it, got it. I was That's like, wow, all. you guys are off. I'm like, I like this. I like where this is going. Yeah, I wish. And so you guys are really doing great, man. We got yeah. the whole team working and having fun on Friday while I'm out fishing and yeah. Al's out doing racing on his Indy 500 cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sounds cool. Now, I was, I was talking with a mentor of mine once about it's always been extremely hard for me to fire people. Uh, I think it is for most of us. We're compassionate people. I remember back in college, I was working for the computer help desk at the time. And the Celissa Manley, who was a great mentor, she pulled me in because I was one of the supervisors and we were having basically a firing conversation with a student. It was a, it was a student job. These were all student jobs and Celissa was a full-time employee. Bless her heart. And so she kind of wanted to test me out and see how I was in sort of a firing interview. And I remember, Lance, I remember sitting there and I was, it was obvious this, this kid was not a fit and he was not performing. 
But I, I just had all these stories about how we were going to ruin his life. This firing at college was going to completely oh. decimate him forever. He was going to crush his confidence. You know, so I was just really hesitant. I like, I felt it was my personal responsibility to nurture this young student and help him survive. And, you know, we don't want to fire him. Now, one of my, one of my mentors taught me once. He said, Enoch, look, because I'm like, well, I'm sort of, I'm a people pleaser sometimes. I struggle with this thing of wanting to make people happy, et cetera. He's all, a lot of people say that. He's all, but consider that you're not a people pleaser. What you are is a conflict avoider. Mm. And I was like, so true. oh, guilty as charged. I mean, you're right. I'm a conflict avoider, right? So for you, what do you, what do you think? What's the fine line between hoping someone will let themselves out the firm, as you mentioned, just keep them around long enough and eventually they'll maybe they'll leave and just taking a more direct approach like we know it's not a fit let's hire them here what's the line between that for you personally a giant screw up uh where it costs money it's yeah. it's, okay. it's very simple yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give you one really good example we had uh uh this didn't this didn't end up in a firing um it could, because I think everybody that's where the street three strike rule comes in so I would I would frame it in that way I would frame it in Everybody will make a mistake. Nobody's perfect. We are not God. And uh, so one, one, one of our best employees now, he's like, I love, I just love this guy. He, uh, when he, when he, so he came back from like a sabbatical or something. So he'd been out of a practice for a while, came back, um, and then was working on a grading plan. And he, our big thing at the firm is like, we use Revit because we don't lie, meaning we model everything. It's the truth. The truth is the truth. It's going to set us free and all of that. So uh, he lied with like a like a filled region. Like he started doing CAD stuff in Revit, and then they went and built the house. And then it was like, "Hey man, oh, we got a call from the from the owner. Hey man, we can't get a building permit or built. We can't get CO. I'm like, oh, why? What happened? What happened during construction? Well, you guys designed the house too high, and now our grade to our driveway is twenty percent." And yeah, I can see your face. Every, hopefully everybody's watching on YouTube. They can too. And it was like, whoa, you know, one of those like, oh God, what's going to, I could just hear lawyers. I can hear, oh God, we're going to get subpoenaed. Oh. And um, luckily there was a workaround. I, I did have to hire a like surveyor to come out and do some, we had to get some extra points. I had to sort of, our structure engineer is my, one of my good friends. He, he was like, don't worry, I'll be easy on you. Like, it's going to take me two hours. I'm going to charge you an hour. We'll figure this out. We figured it out. We wrote, we wrote something to the city. It was okay. It ended up working out okay. But I said, that's strike one. Like, you ever do that again? Like, so there you go. So that would be like, if you okay. did that again, yep. something like that, you're yep. out of here. Yeah. Okay. That's very, very clear. <sighs> now, <laughs> I was having flashbacks sometimes when I cost my firm money when I was working as an employee. Yeah. Yeah. Bless, bless all firm owners' hearts. I mean, just seriously. All right. Now, number three, you said was like the third. The third biggest challenge is maintaining your staff. Maintaining the staff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. so. That's where we're at now. It's so interesting with this evolution over ten years, um, about twelve years now. Sorry of uh just going through all these periods of hiring them well we had to fire people we didn't even think about that and then now we're in this maintenance and growth phase and growth phase meaning hopefully we end up with the denver franchise i did mention that earlier in the show we do have a denver satellite office now it's not a full franchise yet um we had we have employees you have we have young employees we're a millennial firm we're a millennial led firm we're a millennial employed firm and there are some Gen Zers too. And, uh, you know, you're young, you want to go to the city. You're not like me and Al. You need to be into the countryside with your family and space yet. So we recognize that. And we know that. So there's people that lived in Denver. They wanted to, they wanted to stop commuting up to Longmont. It's about 45 minutes to an hour each, each, each way. It's a long, it's a lot. Gas is crazy. So we started that office. And that really kicked into gear the idea of if we, one of the, my best business mentors at the beginning of my career is Robert Wygant with Sumex Design. And he used to, one of the, I will never forget this phrase. And he said, look, if you're ever going to grow your firm and if you're ever going to even retire or sell, you need to replace, you need to find somebody who can replace you. 
Like you, you, know, you need to start. That's that's the key to multiplication here. Like yes, the work will come if you do good work. The work will come. People will find you. People will refer you. It happens. You just you already have that lance. He goes. What you need to do is figure out how to replace yourself. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to hire the right people, like we all talked about before. Hopefully not fire them because they you manage them correctly and you hired the right folks and they did all the right things. How do you maintain those people? How do you keep them happy, right? Well, I think you need to have a strong sense of economics. And not a, not you can't lie to yourself too either and believe like government numbers about CPI and inflation. It's like, no, this is if, you know, they say 2%, like we know it's all 10%. And so, you know, one of the after we after those two gals quit, um what we did is we ended up we gave a 10% raise across the board just instantly to everybody because we did the math. Like I said, we we went and looked at the profit, and we were like, I don't want to lose anybody else. The core we have, those two were the newest, too, you know, so they weren't the core of where we were at. I was like, we looked at, we really sat down, Alex and I looked at the core of staff we have, and we were like, oh, we can actually franchise with this group of people. Like, we identified who, who could potentially be a junior partner, senior partner eventually, all of those things. Who works, who is going to be able to lead teams, who's not, and kind of laid a little roadmap out. Um... And we realized, well, first of all, we got to make sure they stay with the firm, right? We have we have a good culture. We got rid of the bad part of the culture. We got to make sure that uh, we keep them happy. You have to make you have we have, they have to be well fed. They can't have that anxiety hanging over them about making ends meet. Some people are ready to start start making families, you know, keeping families and everything like that. So there's the monetary side. There's like I said the uh, and then the flexibility side. And then there's like sort of this organic ownership, not, not necessarily, I don't mean in the traditional sense of we have allowed employees to buy shares of the company or anything like that. I mean, in the ownership of our culture, of what we do and how we project what we do to people. So last summer we had a retreat, very first retreat we ever did. Uh, we rented like 10 cabins up in, um, up in the mountains. And uh, then we would have a meditation sessions. My wife used to run meditation sessions in Boulder when she was younger. So she got to do that for us. And um, what we did is we did a morning session. We did a noon session and then we did an evening session each day. And um, a theme that Alex and I heard. And so one of the, what we did in the, within the meditation sessions, it was like, you need to visualize yourself, your perfect self, visualize your perfect uh, day at F9 and visualize your perfect project and then visualize your perfect future. And then people would do that. And then we would have like a writing session where people would sketch things out. So for instance, some of the things were the exercises were, uh, we, we went over this in detail on the show too, if anybody wants to check it out on ours. Uh, we would hear consistent buzzwords and themes come out from everybody. And Alex and I, like we kind of dismissed ours because we wanted to, make it so that we could have this organic uh, upwards from the people that we employ. And it was a lot of sustainability talk, a lot of uh, green talk. And so what we did, so the formation, the thing that happened after that was I, I it was about a, it took me about a week to kind of just mentally process what just happened. And then one morning I text down and I said, Hey, I got an idea. It's like, I don't want all that. Like the retreat was great just for team building Everybody getting to know each other. Everybody got to meet each other's wives and husbands and partners and all of that. Um, that was all good and grand. But like, I want a, something to come from this positive that helps the firm, helps the folks, helps everybody. And uh, it was, uh, let's start a sustainability committee. And I know that word probably should just makes people shudder every once in a while, committee. But we're a nimble firm, so we don't waste time with it. And so uh, what I t we brought all the firm down and we said, look, we, we, here's, we heard these words over and over again, you know, sustainability and green and uh, uh, e e ethics, uh, design ethics and stuff like that. And I said, um, I, I, I just was honest with everybody. I said, like, I, I live that life already. I have a nonprofit uh, that is a, a, a community garden. I'm good there. Like, I feel like I do my part. I, it's a lot of time, energy, money. I sequester plenty of CO2. I live in a, a house with solar panels. It's got net zero landscaping. Like, I have chickens. I am I catch fish. I eat them. I'm good. Like, I feel ethically good. I go, but you guys, I get the sense that there's some anxiety there. So, so I want you guys to take some action. And I said, 
Um, we need to do what Jordan Peterson says: clean your house before you criticize, or clean your room before you criticize the world. So we're going to clean F9. So I said, I want you guys to prove, and I want you guys to go through F9, go through the office, go through our practice, and figure out ways. And I want you to demonstrate it on the website about how we are sustainable. And so they went through and they found like, okay, now we're going to switch out and we're going to do all censored timers on like the bathroom lights and every light. Um, we're going to set the timer uh, for the air conditioning and the heating and cooling and see how much money that saves us. And then they came up with, well, what about, what about if we, like, could we work from home? And this is during the hype of everybody's working from home. And I'm like, this is not a long-term thing, you guys. Like, this is, I don't care what the media says. Like, this is such nonsense. We're social creatures. Like, what it's going to, and I said, but we, what we are okay is, like, what if we did it on Wednesdays? What if we did work from home Wednesdays? You guys will save gas. It will, it will break up your week. Um, and then, Surprisingly, what that did is that also gave me and Alex back the original. Just now it's just me and Al in the office because we don't work. We just we love to come into the office. So, I mean, we live closer to I live five minutes away. Al lives like 15 minutes away. They live a little bit further out. Uh, so now all of a sudden it was like, oh, Al, I forgot. It was just me and you back in the day. And that's kind of re-energized us from a principal standpoint. Um, so all of that then ended up on our website. And I said, there you go. So now that's, we've established this guys and gals that like, I don't feel, if you guys feel unethical about, you know, us not trying to do our best with the environment and everything, I feel unethical about us being preachy to clients if we aren't already doing that. And so now, now we can like point to things that we're doing in the office and talk about things that we're doing in the office. And we live in Boulder County anyway, which is very progressive. It's so people are already always thinking about that stuff. So now then when they go to the sustainability part on our page, like we're practicing it, we're preaching it. We already love F, you know, this is me speaking like I'm a potential client. We already love F9, what they're doing design wise. Oh, and they're sustainable. Perfect. Like hook, line and sinker. So really the whole feedback loop kind of came through with that. And then like, what is it? So I want everybody listening to think about like, what did that do to the employees psychologically? Now they own that whole part of the firm and that work and like they're responsible for it that has to mean some semblance of loyalty and wanting to continue that and that their boss and that their bosses their employers like listen to them and help them implement those things on, on company money obviously i love it that's a brilliant case study of ownership well you've really rocked it here um I didn't interject much. I just let you go because it's all such great content. Lance, I don't necessarily have any follow-up questions, but anything that you wanted to share just to tie a knot on this concept of hiring and maintaining a team? Uh, just listen um, but and trust your gut. I think those two things are will, will take you a long way in that first hire, the second hire, and, and all the way through through your career. Beautiful. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.